We begin our show, though, with the war in Ukraine and that highly anticipated speech by Russian President Vladimir Putin. That's right. Today is Victory Day in Russia, a holiday that marks the anniversary of the Soviet Union's victory over Nazi Germany in World War II. And Russia is celebrating the occasion with a massive military parade. But the event has been overshadowed by the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Speaking at the ceremony, President Putin attempted to justify the war by accusing the West of provoking Russia. NATO countries didn't want to hear us, and this means that in reality they had quite different plans. And we saw that. They were openly preparing another punitive operation in Donbass to an aggression against our historical lands, including Crimea. They were creating an, an unacceptable threat to us right at our borders. The danger grew every day, and the Russia delivered a preventive strike against the aggressor. That was uh, a forced, timely and the only correct decision. Meanwhile, on the ground in Ukraine, President Zelensky said 60 people who were sheltering in a school in eastern Ukraine have been killed in a Russian airstrike. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us from the central Ukrainian city of Poltava. And our White House correspondent Carol Lee joins us from Washington. Good morning to you both. Matt, let's start things off with you. The world was waiting for this speech by President Putin on Victory Day. Of course, every word matters given Russia's ongoing invasion. Did we learn anything new about his plans for the war in Ukraine? And what were some of the biggest takeaways? Yeah, it was really interesting because, you know, it, what we learned was that we didn't get anything from May 9th. It turned out to be kind of a nothing burger, but it was remarkable in the sense in what he did not say. Uh, it turned out that, you know, I was expecting, and a lot of people here, a lot of military analysts were expecting some sort of major announcement. They were expecting him to declare war, not just on Ukraine, but on the entire West, on NATO, to maybe launch an attack right before or right after the speech that would destroy something big here. He would uh, announce mass conscription for the Russian public. None of these things happened, and instead, this victory day passed, like they often do, with a rousing speech and a massive parade and a show of arms and just militarized pomp and circumstance. So it was remarkable in the sense that none of those things happened. Uh, instead, uh, Vladimir Putin did what we kind of, ex what you know, he had been doing before. He sort of reheated some of his previous justifications for the war in Ukraine, and he drew a false parallel between the fight in Ukraine and the Nazi, the fight against the Nazis back in World War II, 77 years ago, which was, of course, what Victory Day is commemorating. He was surrounded by the surviving veterans of World War II while he was on the dais there, but he didn't really spend a whole lot of time talking about them. Instead, he went right into Ukraine. He did not use the word Ukraine, mm -hmm. which was interesting, but also revealing because, of course, to use the word Ukraine would be to acknowledge its existence. And the whole point of Vladimir Putin's fight here is that he believes that Ukraine is part of Russia and he denies their, their claim to nationhood at all. So this was an interesting event, but one that was somewhat anticlimactic. Guys? <laughs> Hmm. Carol, let's bring you in. We heard from Matt, no major announcements, but we do know that in the U.S., our country announced a new round of sanctions on Russia following President Biden's virtual meeting with G7 leaders. What came out of those talks and what's included in these latest measures? Well, there are four essentially places that the U.S. is now sanctioning Russia again on, and that is in the financial sector. They have said that any U.S. person, so any American, cannot provide financial assistance, guidance, consultations, that sort of stuff, to anyone inside of Russia. So that's one place where the, the U.S. decided to sanction. And then also they sanctioned three state-run media companies, so you can't advertise or do any sales with these three state-run media organizations. The other things that they did were export controls. This has been one of the key tools that the U.S. has used against Russia. And so there's a ban or rest new restrictions on exports having to do with sort of commercial activity, things like wood and, and other materials. And then they also sanctioned they're not going to allow visas for some 2,600 individuals inside of Russia. And so that's, again, going after all these different areas in which the U.S. feels they have some more ability to expand upon sanctions they've already implemented. Notable, however, is they didn't do some of the most stringent sanctions that they could do, notably that labeling of Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism, which has support in the Congress 
from Democrats and Republicans. But this is all designed for the U.S. and the Europeans to keep up this sort of steady drumbeat of sanctions, as they say, to try to ratchet up the cost for Vladimir Putin in this war. And beyond sanctions and diplomatic efforts, let's talk about what's going on on the ground in Ukraine, Matt. Over the weekend, I know a Russian bomb hit a school in eastern Ukraine where people were sheltering. What can you tell us about that attack? And in Mariupol, I understand that all civilians have now been evacuated from that besieged steel plant, but military personnel are still inside, right? Can you walk us through that? Yeah, I mean, on that school attack, you said it all. That it was a devastating attack here in the eastern part of the country. Um, you know, it, it killed, it sounded like, uh, we didn't know the casualty numbers as of late last night, but now it sounds like all of those people who were missing, all 60, are now dead, according to President Zelensky. Uh, it was a horrific attack, uh, and one that, once again, is aimed at civilian infrastructure and places where parents and children gather. Another uh, just a horrific event, and one that points to the inhumanity of Russia's attacks on Ukraine. That, again, we see in Mariupol, that besieged city in the southeastern part of the country. That has, city has been under siege, especially... ...which we understand from over the weekend, we got announcements from the Ukrainian government that all of the civilians, hundreds of them, have been evacuated from that, some under that steelworks. Now, what remains are what's thought to be thousands, hundreds of soldiers who are still there fighting, particularly fighters from the Azov Brigade, uh, right wing, paramilitary group that has had a lot of battlefield success and has been holding off that steelworks from Russian assaults for months now. Now, we heard from some soldiers who were still holed up there. They spoke with the media, and they said that they are going to fight to the death. They are prepared to fight to the death. They see this as a death sentence, but they are not going to be giving up. So we can expect to see quite a lot more violence from down there in Mariupol. Guys? Really sobering reporting. Matt, thank you for that. And Carol, thank you for the context. For more, let's bring in Clint Watts. He's a distinguished research fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and an NBC News national security analyst. Clint, always good to have you with us. So there had been this speculation, as we've been talking about, that Putin would use Victory Day to do something like officially declare war on Ukraine. Now, that's an important distinction since it's been being called a special military operation in Russia. And then that could have potentially intensified the attacks even further. Or maybe that he would claim victory in the east, which is not the reality on the ground at this point. But neither of those things happen. So let's walk through what could be next. Now that this looming deadline of Victory Day that we were worried about the lead-up to is over, do you expect to see any change in strategy here? What do we think we'll see from Russia moving forward? I think it was an interesting signal today. It did not call for any mobilizations. That would essentially bring about uh, intensity in the fight. He would then say he's going to commit more troops. We did not hear that. We did not hear that from Vladimir Putin. I think what we're starting to see is what's been in Donbass since 2014. I like to remind people this part of Donbass uh, between Luhansk and Donetsk, there's been fighting there since 2014 with the separatist groups that were there that were backed by the Russians. This has been an enduring battle, and I think that's a lot more what we're looking like uh, we're going to see here in eastern Ukraine uh, from here on out. Just a slugfest back and forth, some pushing and pulling. Some days the Ukrainians will be advancing, some days the Russians will. And it really comes down to just manpower, fuel, and, and, and ammunition uh, over the next one, two, maybe even three to four months. And, Clint, you know, there's been some back and forth kind of on how Russia has been doing in the east. Of course, we know the bombardment in Mariupol has just been so intense, but then in other places they've been stalled. What is the latest along that eastern front, especially as it seems as though Russia's real goal comes into focus here being that, that land corridor there? Yeah, so the big picture here is in Belgorod. You have the Russians putting a lot of resupply, a lot of manpower, a lot of logistics and weaponry, essentially reorgan reorganizing a lot of these forces that came in from north and reinforcements here inside Russia. Separately, Kharkiv, this is where we've, you know, seen some uh, Ukrainian success in a counterattack. Here, they made some advances over the last week. They've also been able to push this perimeter out. And when they can push that perimeter out, then the Russians can't do indirect fire central artillery bombings as close into the city with as much precision. The other thing to look for, oh, sorry about that. The other thing to look for as my map comes back up is in the east, you're seeing the Russians push through a corridor known as Izium. Izium is this key one that we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks. And if the Russians can essentially bring all of this resources here, 
They can also unite essentially multiple fronts. You've seen them take a little bit of ground here. They would like to go over to Slovyansk. If they can get to Slovyansk, they can envelop a lot of the Ukrainian military forces that are here in this part of Donbass. And Clint, quickly, let's talk about a different region slightly. Odessa was hit with cruise missiles as the bombardment, of course, of Mariupol continues. But what are we seeing down there? A strange but not unprecedented move by the Russians, which is they're building up some of their forces, essentially signaling that they're building for a front here in the south, much similar to what they're doing in the east. They may try and push towards Zaporizhia. They would like to do this because they would like to bring all of this area essentially under their control. They've also always wanted to move and take this ground over here to Transnistria, but they failed in the early parts of the war to be successful in that move. So it's doubtful that they're really going to be able to do this, but it doesn't mean that they won't try, particularly if the east were to fall quickly. They may try and push more troops essentially to the north. Several of those uh, battalion tactical groups mm. that are now released from fighting in Mariupol, they're starting to move north towards Donetsk. All right. Clint Watts, thank you so much for walking us through that and for some bored wizardry mid-hit. We appreciate it. Thanks. Here in the U.S., gas guzzlers beware. The average price of gas could hit a record high today. AAA says the national average of a gallon of gas yesterday was $4.32 a gallon. That's a penny shy of the record sent back in March. We should note these numbers are not adjusted for inflation. This climb in gas prices comes as we approach the unofficial start of summer, Memorial Day. Just three weeks away, the U.S. could set new records for gas prices by then. NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward is tracking the latest on these rising gas prices. Jake, good morning. You're based in the San Fran area where we're seeing the highest average price for regular gas at $5.85 a gallon. How are people there and around the country coping with this rising price? Well, Zinkley, I think it's really important to just see it in the broader context of economic hardship. Right across the United States, the median U.S. income is just a little more than $30,000 a year. And transportation is typically a household's fourth largest expenditure behind health care, housing, and food. And so if you're suddenly having to pay $100, as I have to and so many people have to here in the Bay Area to fill your car, that is a significant portion of a take-home pay that may really only be about a thousand dollars a week. We've spoken to people, uh, for instance, operating a, uh, a food bank who say that they actually have people walking in, people who own cars, but walk in to get their weekly haul of food simply to save that extra hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So this is really hitting people immediately and very deeply, Zinglai. Wow, walking even when they have a car. I think that really shows the enormity of the issue. And I know that Memorial Day weekend is also fast approaching. A lot of people want to travel. So how is this impacting them and what should people expect if they're trying to get out of town? Well, the reason that analysts believe that we have not seen the record high is because of the approach of Memorial Day. Typically, in the weeks leading up to it is when you see gas prices across the nation go up. We've certainly seen that here. And now the question is, will they go high enough that people might actually change their Memorial Day weekend plans? We spoke to somebody from Gas Buddy who looks at these prices to ask, is there a point at which we really might change our plans? And here's how he described it. I think California, that shock and awe happens at $6 a gallon. And I think for the rest of the country, a lot of consumers are probably saying $5 a gallon. Given the fact that the economy is seeing some strength coming out of COVID, uh, I think consumers have a little bit more appetite to hit the road. That is $4 may slow them down, but I think it's the $5 mark where there's a real sticking point. And that shock that he's talking about there is being felt all over the country. Michigan, Ohio, New Jersey have seen prices increase at these incredible paces the last few weeks, and it doesn't look like it's over yet, Sinclair. And, Jake, briefly, this is not just about individuals, right? But how are uh, industries also being affected by these rising prices? Well, there's really almost no corner of the world economy that isn't touched in some way by the price of fuel, whether you're shipping something, whether you're making something out of plastic, which is a petroleum-based product. I mean, all of that is affected. For instance, over the weekend, the consortium of the largest airlines in Nigeria essentially canceled all flights, said, we're not flying anymore, stranding millions of people because the price of aviation fuel has increased fourfold. Well, now they've actually switched because the government had to come in and say, please don't do that. And now 
now they're in negotiations with the government to keep going. But you're talking here about a, a, a thing that's not just affecting Memorial Day weekend plans. It's affecting the world economy, Zinclair. Jake Ward, thank you. This week's Meet the Press took a closer look at the future of contraceptives and abortions in Mississippi, plus what the role of the Supreme Court will be following the leak of Justice Alito's draft opinion. Here's a look at the highlights with Meet the Press moderator Chuck Todd. Good morning on this week's Meet the Press. We focus on the Supreme Court's draft decision overturning Roe and how it could further divide the country. I spoke with Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves and Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel. Plus, the leak itself marks a watershed moment for the Supreme Court. I spoke with two former clerks about what it means for the future of the high court. Here are some of the most important answers from Meet the Press Compressed. What about uh, contraception and, 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 the, and birth control, particularly IUDs? I mean, is this total ban that gets put in on abortion, is that going to have an impact on women that decide to have certain types of birth control like IUDs? I don't think that it is going to apply to those uh, that choose to use birth control. Um, I believe that um, clearly uh, life begins at conception, and I am trying uh, very hard to, uh, to, to make sure that everyone uh, in America knows that the overturning of Roe certainly puts the decision-making on abortion policy back in the elected representatives in, in each of the 50 states. Look, you've just said that you believe life be begins at conception. If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, um, would you sign it? Well, I don't think that's going to happen in Mississippi. I'm sure they'll have those conversations in, in other states. But you're not states, answering but, the question. Uh, as is always the case with things... Well, that's always the case. There, there's, uh, there's so many things that we can talk about. What, what the next movement in, in, in the pro-life movement, in, in my view, Chuck, is, is simple. And that is, we must prove that being pro-life is not just about anti-abortion. You said if, if Roe is overturned, you are not going to... Uh, enforce this 1931 law, but you can't prevent others in the state from enforcing the law. Explain. This incredibly draconian and strict 1931 law would criminalize abortion in this state with virtually no exceptions, no exception for rape, for incest, no exception for medical emergencies. I refuse to enforce uh, this draconian law that will endanger their lives uh, and put at jeopardy the health, safety, and welfare of the lives of each and every woman in the state of Michigan. Does this mean a doctor cannot perform the procedure that's necessary, essentially, when, you, when you've identified a miscarriage? Yeah, I think that what's going to happen is doctors will be so afraid uh, that there'll be investigations into these procedures, even understanding that many times those procedures are performed where there, you know, there is no viability any longer. But because it's the same procedure that you might perform uh, for an abortion, they'll be so concerned that these uh, cases will be investigated, it will have a chilling effect, and you won't have basic medical health care that is required for women not to um, have extreme health problems or even die. Doctors simply are not going to perform those procedures anymore because they don't want to go to prison for it. Our thanks to Chuck Todd for that look at Meet the Press. Let's get a check at your morning news now weather, which means Michelle Grossman joins us now on this Monday morning. Hey, Michelle. Good morning to you both. And we are talking about the heat today. The heat is on. It's feeling like summer from the south all the way to the Midwest. We're talking about over 100 degrees in some spots. So here's that summer-like warmth, 98 degrees today in San Antonio, 102 in Abilene. The record is 101, so we certainly could break that today. And look how far north this warmth reaches, up to Kansas City, 91 degrees today. The record is 91, so we could tie that. We're going to see that as we go throughout the afternoon. As we near tomorrow, records possible across 16 states from the south all the way to the upper Midwest. Madison, Wisconsin, 85 degrees is your forecasted high tomorrow. 87 is a record, and St. Louis into the low to mid-90s. That warmth is going to spread east. Chicago, you're going to be near 90 degrees on Thursday. You've been so chilly for so long, so finally feeling like summer there. 87 degrees on Friday, and we're looking at the mid-70s in New York City. That's right around normal for this time of year, but after a cold and rainy weekend, that's going to feel really good. Pittsburgh, you're going to be into the low 80s. So we have this big area of high pressure. It's pumping in that warmth. It's also really kicking up the winds as well. So we're going to see winds gusting near 60 five miles per hour. That's going to help aid some fire danger. So as we go throughout the day, 
10 million at risk in the southwest where you see the pink here that is your red flag warning and that's because we have super dry terrain we have those really gusty winds we have the warmth too and we could see the potential for some wildfire a spread as we go throughout the day especially where we see the hot pink that's your extreme risk for parts of new mexico colorado colorado and the panhandle of texas now windy winds we're going to see winds gusting up to 70 miles per hour in some spots six million at risk from the northern plains all the way down to the southwest high wind warning that's in your purple and on the northern end of this ridge we're looking at the threat for severe weather today. We could see gusty winds, damaging hail, and also a few tornadoes possible, especially where you see that yellow. So as we look at the week ahead, warmer in the northeast, storms continue in the northern plains, and then record heat, you guys, in the southern plains. Some spots, can you believe it, near 106. Wow. Oh, my goodness. After, yeah, there's a lot going on. It's true. After all the rain, I could deal with yeah. some sunshine, though. Yeah, exactly. Same. Please. Same. We are very yes. ready. <laughs> okay, thanks, Michelle. See you in a bit. Welcome back. Let's get to the latest COVID news. Over the weekend, New York Governor Kathy Hochul announced she tested positive for the virus. The governor says she's asymptomatic and has already been vaccinated and boosted. She says she will isolate and work remotely this week. Her positive test, though, comes as cases continue to rise nationally and in New York, where upstate's been a hot spot for the last several weeks, according to the CDC. Joining us now to discuss the latest on this is Dr. Amish Adalja. He's a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Doctor, good morning. Good to have you with us. So let's dig into these rising cases. We did get a new warning from the Biden administration, actually, that a new COVID wave this fall could potentially infect 100 million people. Now, we've seen cases rise over the last month or so. So what do you make of that potential outlook? But, you know, also being positive, keeping some context here. While these cases have risen, hospitalizations and deaths have remained relatively low. So just help us understand all this. And that's exactly how to understand it. This is a virus that's not going to be disappearing. It's not going to be something that is eradicated or eliminated. And we're always going to see cases kind of ebb and flow, see spikes, see hot spots, especially with seasons like the fall in the Northeast and maybe the summer in, in the South. Uh, and I think we have to be prepared for that. But what we'll see increasingly is that those cases don't translate into hospitals being in crisis because we've got a highly immune population We've got antivirals, we've got monoclonal antibodies, tools that we didn't have. So this is becoming more manageable, but yes, we'll see cases. I want to ask you now about kids, because we know the FDA could authorize vaccines for children under five as soon as next month. According to the F Pfizer Family Foundation, though, listen to this stat. Just 18 percent of parents of young children say that they're eager to get their child vaccinated. Another 38 percent actually saying they want to wait are those numbers that you'd expect from this group, the parents of young kids? And what do you think could be done to make parents more confident in the vaccines? If you look at the 5 to 11 age group, which has had access to the vaccine, that really is kind of it tracks with that number, where about a quarter of those children have been vaccinated at this point. So we didn't expect to see a huge number of people. But it is important that we still get this vaccine out because it is safe, it is effective, and there are children that would benefit from it. But we have to do a lot with vaccine hesitancy in the pediatric populations. I think that because COVID-19 is not a serious illness for most children, a lot of parents don't think that this is a vaccine that's valuable to them. But it is. Why put your child through COVID-19 if you can decrease decrease it with the vaccine. And I think we really have to meet parents where they are, get pediatricians involved to talk about the safety of this vaccine, not just for the under fives, but even five to 11s where vaccination is lagged as well. Absolutely. And yes. doctor, before I let you go, I do want to ask you about some new information. We potentially have this recent study that focused on COVID patients who are hospitalized. The study showed that 13 percent of those patients have serious neurological symptoms. I think we've been hearing a little bit by bit, a little bit more about the neurological side effects of this. We had a study recently talking about an impact on people's IQ. Can you explain what these symptoms are, these neurological symptoms and how concerned we should be? So in this study, this is about patients that were hospitalized. And what they're looking at are disorders of cognition, the way people think, strokes, those types of uh, uh, conditions were, were at least a, there's a baseline rate of them that were occurring in patients that were hospitalized. And we've known for a while that serious illness does have neurologic consequences in some patients. I think what the bigger question that we need to answer is what about mild illnesses and what rate of neurologic complications that we do we see there and, and that whole long COVID hit, issue. I think it's a little bit hard to extrapolate hospitalized patients to the average person who doesn't need hospitalization because it's a very different level of severity. Dr. Adalja, as always, thank you so much. We always appreciate your context and helping us make it, making us feel a little bit better. <laughs> now let's take a look at what's making news around the world this morning, starting with a historic election in Northern Ireland. That's right. Janice Mackey Freyer joins us from Beijing with that and more. Hey, Janice, good morning. 
Hey, good morning. History is being made in Northern Ireland. Sinn Féin, once closely associated with the IRA, has emerged as the leading party in regional elections. And that means that Sinn Féin could have, that they could present a nationalist leader for Northern Ireland for the first time. Now, Sinn Féin was, uh, uh, is against rule by United Kingdom. It's pushing for reunification with Ireland and was once associated with the bloody military campaign against British rule that lasted several decades. They still want unification, so this political victory is seen as a milestone. Here in Beijing, more signs that a full lockdown might still be in the cards to control the COVID outbreak here. Every day, there are new restrictions here. Uh, today, most districts uh, told people to work from home. Already, schools, theaters, parks, they're all closed. And there is mass testing every day, 20 million people across the city. People are also stockpiling food. I am one of them. Uh, people are still worried about a full lockdown, like the one in Shanghai, where restrictions are tightening again in some areas to stay in line with China's zero COVID rules. And a surprise performance in Ukraine. U2's frontman Bono and guitar player The Edge gave an impromptu concert in a subway station in Kyiv that people have been using as a bomb shelter. Now they performed as a personal on the personal invitation of Ukraine's president to show solidarity with Ukrainians. Uh, Ukrainian artists joined them as well. They did an acoustic set with some U2 hits, including With or Without You and Angel of Harlem. They also did a cover version of the song Stand By Me. And Bono called on world leaders to stand with Ukrainians and millions of refugees. Wow. And brilliant. that is a look at your headlines this hour. Wow, amazing mm. to see them there, too. Just yes. like even in the first place, never mind that performance. Music so healing. So glad that was happening. Janice, <laughs> thank you. A new study shared exclusively with NBC News takes a closer look at just how much the child tax credit payments helped 36 million families during the COVID pandemic. According to Children's Health Watch, the credit payments decreased food insecurity by 26 percent. But the study also shed light on the flaws of the program, including what type of families were qualifying for the payments. NBC News Now correspondent Dasha Burns spoke to one mom who was calling on Congress to extend the credits. Dasha, good morning. Hey, think like good morning. Look, it's no secret that American families have been hit hard by record inflation, more folks struggling to put food on the table, to put gas in the tank. But at the same time, those millions of families who were receiving the child tax credit monthly payments for families with children, they stopped receiving those payments. Now, this study shared exclusively with NBC News showed just how much of a lifeline it was since those payments stopped food insecurity has increased by 12 percent. Those payments ended because Congress did not pass an extension of the child tax credit. And West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin was the lone Democrat to vote against that extension. We spoke with a mom in West Virginia about just how much those payments meant to her and what she's hoping her senator will do next. Watch. I to go myself. Oh, you want to drop all the way down? Okay. Kristen Olson is a single mom to three boys. Her youngest, George, is four. I just want him to know and to have the same opportunities as everybody else. Last year, Kristen felt like she had some room in her budget to give George those opportunities. Today, she says, is a different story. So, like, all of our bills keep going up. Gas, right? Utilities, water, like everything. My Food. rent, my rent went up $75 a month in January. Food. And so then, then they take that $300 away. Oh, are we gonna get a car? Chris and George are among nearly 36 million families who received the expanded child tax credit in 2021. When those payments stopped in January, the struggle started. We've been finding clothes giveaways. You took advantage of some food pantries. Too. Yeah, took was advantage that, of Was it your pantries. first time going to a food pantry? <laughs> yes. And, and I've struggled before, right? I've been a single mom almost my whole life, 24 years, but it got to the point where we had no food. New data from Children's Health Watch shared exclusively with NBC News reveals just how much of a lifeline these payments were for families like this one. Finding the advanced child tax credit payments led to a reduction in food insufficiency. Children's Health Watch also finding racial and economic disparities among those who received payments. 
while families were receiving the child tax credit payments in the fall, there was a 26% reduction in food insufficiency among families with children. When we looked at that same data set in February, after the monthly payments had expired for families, what we saw was a 12% increase in food insufficiency for families. The fact that we saw a significant reduction in food insecurity really speaks to the fact that people were using this to afford basic needs. I didn't used to have to pinch pennies like this. Kristen lives in West Virginia, where 93% of children qualified for the child tax credit. These families haven't received a payment since December, when Congress failed to pass the Build Back Better Act. The legislation would have made these payments permanent. But Chris's senator, Joe Manchin, was the lone Democrat to stand in the way, saying he views the credit as a disincentive to work. I've been basically very clear on that. I think there should be a work requirement. And privately saying he worried people were using the money to buy drugs. For Chris, who works multiple jobs, that hurt to hear. But it's like he's just saying you're not worth investing in when they're not giving us this money. No. Your children aren't worth it. What would getting the child tax credit back mean for your son George? For George, it would mean going back to jujitsu, easier school clothes. It would mean a better new sneakers. With Congress back in session, lawmakers are working to pass a slimmed-down version of the president's Build Back Better agenda. Republican opponents of President Biden's agenda say policies like the expanded child tax credit payments are contributing to the country's record levels of inflation because it increased spending. Now, parents like Chris are looking for relief more than ever when it seems less likely they'll get it from Washington. The work, the side hustles, all of it, <laughs> um, all of the hustle that you put in every day to provide for him, what do you hope that turns into? I just want him to, to know that he has the power to, you know, live his best life. Now, Zingley, despite all of those positive impacts, the study also found disparities in who received the child tax credit. For example, immigrant mothers, families with immigrant mothers were less likely to receive those payments. Latino families were less likely to receive them. And families without active bank accounts were less likely to receive the child tax credit compared to families with active bank accounts. Children's Health Watch does make policy recommendations based on their findings, and they are recommending that Congress pass an extension of the child tax credit, and of course, that those disparities get addressed as well as in class. Hmm. Important reporting. Dasha Burns, thank you. Now, in the days following the leaked draft opinion from the Supreme Court, reaction from both sides has been swift as the possibility of Roe versus Wade being overturned became more real than ever. So what would it mean for women across the country if each state decides whether abortion is legal within its borders or not? NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitali takes a look for us. Abortion is a human right. A week of raw emotions after an unprecedented leak from the Supreme Court. Life is precious. It's a miracle. I'm afraid for my daughters. I'm afraid for my future granddaughters. With the leak affirming what many believed the Supreme Court would decide in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, a wave of new restrictions at the state level. 13 states have trigger laws that will snap into place banning abortion as soon as the Supreme Court announces its decision. Among them, South Dakota. What happens when the Supreme Court makes its ultimate decision? We stop abortion care the very minute that it happens because that that's how the trigger works here. Yes, we would stop that very second. Already one of the most restrictive states for abortion access, they're one of five states in the U.S. that have only one abortion clinic. Patients here wait weeks to receive care due to mandatory three-day waiting periods. Tight limits on telehealth and abortion pill use exacerbate the burden of distance in rural states like this one. For some women, they already are very much living a post row life, it's not possible for them because of their life circumstances. In Missouri, with its single clinic and eight-week ban on abortion on the books, it's a similar story. We know firsthand what a post row reality looks like because we live that reality every single day. But as abortion advocates brace for a world without Roe's protections, anti-abortion activists are mobilizing too. In Louisiana, a new push for a bill that would criminalize abortion, making it a homicide. If we can no, no longer provide care here, I have no idea where a lot of these women will go. While over in Oklahoma, a new ban on abortions after six weeks, when most women don't even know they're pregnant yet. 
And in several states where abortion is protected, actions taken there too. In California, Governor Gavin Newsom pledging a state constitutional amendment enshrining reproductive rights. We will stand tall, we will stand firm, and we will affirm the constitutional, currently constitutionally protected rights of women and girls, their reproductive rights and freedoms in California. Laying the groundwork for the state to become a so-called safe haven for women who live in states where abortion is banned. Across the country, Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont signed into law Thursday a bill protecting abortion seekers and providers from out-of-state lawsuits. And at the clinic at the center of the court's consideration, heavy decisions about the future. We are looking into, oh, we're opening a facility right now in New Mexico that will be one of the states where patients will still be able to obtain um, an abortion. If they leave, it'll leave Mississippi with no abortion clinics in the state. Still, she says, we are not going to just walk away from this. A vow to keep fighting as all eyes now turn to the battles ahead for political control and public opinion. Our thanks to Ali Vitale for that in-depth report there. Welcome back. As the nation's housing market heats up, some homeowners associations are trying to control who can live in their neighborhoods. They say the rapid increase of rental properties owned by investment groups is leading to an unsafe environment for residents. Here's NBC News correspondent Katie Beck. Carrie Miller says her community in Charlotte, North Carolina, looks different now than a year ago. If you put in the effort and people see you putting in the effort, they're going to want to put in the effort. Lawns are better kept. Neighbors are looking out for each other. She says a frightening shooting outside a rental home last February sparked change. It took that for folks to really, really open their eyes. Miller blames the problems on what she calls the investor invasion. A growing trend of corporations buying up single family homes and converting them into rental properties. People who would come in and buy a property and you never see them again. Across town in the Potter's Glen subdivision, Vincent Evans says a flurry of investor buying was followed by rental properties with poor upkeep, a lack of tenant screening, and criminal activity. These investment companies, they want to make money. That's what they're there for. There's no question that investors are making big buys in residential real estate. Numbers from last year show they were behind 18% of all home sales nationwide. And here in Charlotte, 32% of all home sales went to an investor. You're pricing people out and you're not giving people the opportunity to acquire that equity. With high demand and low inventory, first time home buyers face poor odds to beat out big money investors, some backed by Wall Street. So homeowners association leaders like Miller and Evans have gone to work changing the rules. We added a clause that new homeowners have to live in their house for two years before it can be rented or leased. So while we don't target the investors per se, it does that in a roundabout way. Miller's board put a one-year requirement in place, as well as capping rental capacity at 47% of homes in the community. Both have seen a significant decline in investor buying and say conditions and safety have improved. But not all are convinced the process is fair. This is about homeowners associations attempting to dictate who can and cannot live in their communities. The investor industry says HOAs are overreaching their authority. These artificial constructs created by homeowners associations infringe on the pursuit of housing by making housing more restricting, less accessible. What do you say to that? I disagree. Um, when you purchase your home here, you have the opportunity to read and review the documents. You sign off on it. Do you think more HOAs should be fighting back? Absolutely. I want to let them know, like, you know, if you build a relationship within your community, you can get this done as well. An ongoing debate on what is fair when some take profit in a community and others take pride. Katie Beck, NBC News, Charlotte. Now let's talk investments on Wall Street. This week, investors are hoping for steadier ground on Wall Street after a roller coaster start to the month. Oh yeah, Contessa Brewer joins us now with the latest on that and other financial headlines to get your Monday started. Hey, Contessa. Well, we were hopeful, but Monday is not shaping up to be anything other than red. Right now, it looks like the Dow implied open down almost 500 points as the markets try to regain their footing following a volatile week of trading. The Dow is on a six-week losing streak. The S&P 500 and NASDAQ have stretched their losing streaks to five weeks. 
We are seeing real worries about inflation and a slowdown in global growth continuing to linger over stocks. And this week, we're focused on two key reports on consumer and producer price inflation on Wednesday and Thursday. Elon Musk aims to increase Twitter's revenue fivefold by 2028. The New York Times reports uh, that he made a pitch to investors saying that advertising will fall to less than half of total revenue under his leadership, with subscription based services expected to draw in more cash. That would include items like Twitter Blue, the premium subscription service that launched last year. Musk clinched that deal to buy Twitter last month for $44 billion. And the summer movie season's off to a strong start thanks to Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. The Disney and Marvel movie took in an estimated $185 million at the box office this weekend, according to Comscore. That is the biggest opener this year, trailing only Spider-Man Far From Home during the pandemic. And then Spider-Man, of course, gets some of the credit for this massive debut because Doctor Strange appeared prominently in that movie. What else helped? It was playing in more than 4,000 theaters. That always helps. Back yeah, to you. really. For also, sure. I can't believe where the summer movie season is beginning. Look at that. I, I can't wait. June already soon. <laughs> Next month. Lots right. to watch. Contessa, thank you. Thank you. Now to an issue impacting the littlest among us. Baby formula has become the latest product to suffer from supply shortages, forcing retailers to put a limit on how many bottles customers can buy. The result has been alarming for parents who are now forced to take drastic measures to feed their babies. NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson has more on the shortage. This is a pain in the butt to find. From Florida to Missouri to Connecticut, across the country, shelves once filled with baby formula are empty amid a nationwide shortage. I myself am down to one can of formula and I can't find his formula anywhere. 40% of the top selling baby formula products were out of stock at the end of last week, according to Data Assembly, which tracks inventory at thousands of stores throughout the U.S. The number of products sold out nearly doubling since January. A couple stores we've been in we have not had it, and we've had to go to the next location. Experts say the shortage likely won't be going away anytime soon. We're seeing it from your mom and pops all the way up to our large super centers, um, pharmacies, um, almost every store that would carry formula. Inflation, supply chain shortages, and product recalls are to blame, experts say. A massive recall of infant formula is underway after a number of infants became ill. That kind of started the snowball effect of, you know, some formula removed from the shelves, um, other formulas being purchased at a higher volume, and then distributors not being able to keep up. I was crying on the phone with this doctor. I'm like, how am I going to feed my kids? Some stores now placing a cap on how much customers can buy. I ordered some online and they'll limit what you can order. Parents on the hunt for formula say they're seeing a disturbing trend emerging online. They're going to the stores and grabbing what they can find and selling it to people that do need it for more than the double or triple the price. We found many examples of people selling formula online secondhand, priced at double or even more than what they cost at major retailers that are often sold out. I get it. Everybody's trying to make money, but you're making these babies suffer. Out of options, some parents now taking drastic measures, diluting the formula they do have. If you try to dilute the formula to try to make it last longer, that could have really serious medical impact on your baby. Others are making their own formula at home. YouTube searches for homemade baby formula up 211% last week. And there you have it, your very own organic homemade baby formula. Something doctors say can be life-threatening, causing foodborne illness and severe nutritional imbalances. The food and Drug Administration issuing this warning. Homemade infant formula recipes have not been evaluated by the FDA and may lack nutrients vital to an infant's growth. The safest bet is store-bought brands regulated by the FDA, if you can get your hands on it. I get so excited when I find one bottle of formula. Thank you to Priscilla Thompson for that report. And we do have some tips for anyone looking for baby formula. First, ask your pediatrician for help. They say they have the power to special order formula for patients and can provide breast milk, milk banks as a short-term alternative. Mm -hmm. You should also check family-owned pharmacies or convenience stores for more options.
tips, some great tips there. We want to take a moment to congratulate our very own Joe Fryer. On Friday, he won the Glad Media Award for Outstanding TV Journalism segment. He won for his reporting in 2021 on the AIDS epidemic. Joe accepted the award alongside the four men who were profiled in his piece. Joe says it was an honor to win the award and inspiring to tell their story. The award was presented by Amber Tamblin and Niall DeMarco. So congratulations, Joe. We're happy hey, for you. Hey, Joe, we're so happy for Joe. I know he's off this week, of course, uh, getting some much-deserved break, but we're so happy for him. Also, can we talk about his outfit for a minute? I, the pants? I would like them. I would like them. And I'm sure right? it was also incredible to get that award alongside the people oh, he reported goodness, on. Oh, my goodness, absolutely. And that piece was so powerful. I can't forget it. All right, Sinclair, thank you so much. Of course. Now, two Boston journalists revived one of the oldest abolitionist newspapers in the country. Their bold mission to end racism with journalism. NBC News correspondent Harry Smith has the story. Summer 2020. No no peace. There was anger. I'm tired of feeling unsafe. There was anguish on the streets. From that season of unrest came an idea for a new kind of news. It's called The Emancipator. We need to be emancipated from misinformation, disinformation, from extremism, from hate, from xenophobia. We have a lot to be emancipated from. So it's a perfect name. The original Emancipator was America's first abolitionist newspaper, published in Jonesboro, Tennessee in 1820. At the time, a most radical idea. And now? It may be radical and bold to say we need to call for the immediate end of racism, of racial injustice, of racial inequality. But why is that such a bold idea? Why can't we do that? And why can't we do that with journalism? Deborah Douglas and Amber Payne are co-editors of the website, conceived by the Boston Globe and Boston University Center on anti-racist research. In last month's debut, a thoughtful, fact-filled report showing how black student loan debt severely increases the racial wealth gap. When you put out a sharp opinion, an evidence-based opinion that's backed up, with with facts with details you can really change minds and perhaps you can change hearts you could maybe you could change laws the emancipator seeks to be more than an opinion page more than a soapbox it is in search of voices of change some unheard there are people in communities who are agents of their own salvation, but they don't often get the amplification in traditional media to show the work that they're doing on the ground. Different voices, different methods. In The Emancipator, you'll find a comic strip. This one unveils the little-known truth of Dewey from the Dewey Decimal System. File under appalling. The Emancipator hopes to build a sense of community, unafraid of America's unvarnished truths. A lot of times, systems don't even have us in mind. It wasn't created that way. It wasn't exactly. Built that it wasn't way. made for us. But if we're all Americans, right, and we're interested, in investing in the American project, then we're duty bound to deconstruct these systems and rebuild them back up, so we all can benefit from it. We wondered, though, the Emancipator. Why in Boston? Amber and Deborah took me to the African Meeting House, wow. built in 1806. So this is the center of black political culture, life, spirituality, education, right here in Boston. This was where organizing was happening. This was really the heartbeat of the black community. And this is the oldest standing black church building in the country right now. And it was a center for abolitionist activity. William Lord Garrison spoke here, Mariah Stewart, Frederick Douglass. Spoke here. Right here. Right here. Yeah. We stood for a moment in silence, certain we could still hear their voices. Harry Smith, Boston. What a powerful report. There. Incredibly moving. Yeah. So much history in this country. Yeah, absolutely. And so neat to see that revived. Yes. Yeah, something historic. Very Yes. Cool. So thank you for that report. And that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.